Arishem the Judge has hit Marvel Snap like one of Fastos's worst inventions. Let's take a look at how to beat this card that currently has a 75% play rate in High Infinite. We're going to start with a brief overview of the cards that are going to be linchpins of the strategies to beat Arashem. It would be impossible to start with anywhere other than Darkhawk. Arashem is a deck that tries to mitigate its own weakness to Darkhawk with a variety of tech cards, having Blob, being able to copy Blob, but fundamentally this card is still just going to be extremely, extremely large. In most games against an Arashem deck, a Dark Hawk is going to be roughly 30 something power. A Mystique on that Dark Hawk is going to be roughly 30 something power. Those are not locations that a Dark Hawk, that another deck can win. Those are combo level outcomes, right? When you think of a combo deck like Phoenix Force, Phoenix Force is very often getting to at most 32 power in a lane. A Dark Hawk into Arashem is roughly equivalent to a full pop off from Phoenix Force in one lane. It's just very, very difficult for the Arashem deck to beat it without resorting to tech. And if you can throw priority, get, get some discounts going, play Dark Hawk Mystique on the final turn of the game, it's actually just very impossible for an Arashem deck to win. There are ways they can beat a normal Dark Hawk where you just play it out on turn five and leave it there and they rogue it or something, right? They can do that, right? Sometimes they're able to blob Arnim Zola. Like, it's not a 100% win. Nothing in any card game is ever a 100% win. But this is always a great place to start. For the same reason that Loki was good into original Thanos, Loki ends up being very good into the card Arashem. Because Arashem is full of all these payoffs, ways to abuse the extra energy. Loki effectively gets that extra energy just by playing the card Loki and has a consistent early game. The way I've thought about Loki into this matchup is just that it's basically almost always free. It's very, very unlikely that the Loki hand you get is actually bad because Arashem is so full of good cards and so full of big impactful ones as well. So Loki is another place to start if you wanna look at trying to beat Arashem decks. Finally, we can take a look at some combos, especially combos that dodge the tech that Arashem tends to play. It's very rare to see an Arashem deck playing anything along the lines of a Shadow King when their tech is so much more specialized towards dealing with the big stuff that beats them, like Darkhawk. They want to have Enchantress. They want to have Rogue. They want to have Shang-Chi. There's not really a lot of room to get something like a Shadow King in there. That means that you can play for a Phoenix Force endgame because... Outside of those Arashem mirrors, their point totals aren't that completely insane. Their best point totals against a normal deck are things of the nature of Blob into Mystique with a 4-drop, right? That's strong, but it's probably not beating a Phoenix Force pop-off game. So Phoenix Force ends up in a fairly interesting spot as well, as do other combo-style decks. Let's talk about actual decks now. That is the title of the video, after all. This one comes from Yo Woody. It's a very straightforward attempt at grafting the Arashem anti-shell, i.e. Darkhawk stuff, onto a deck that was already good. This is a deck that makes a lot of ethical sense to me. Like, it's saying, okay, we're going to invest in this Darkhawk so we don't lose to other non-Arashem decks, so we have a viable plan into those other non-Arashem decks. When we invest in Darkhawk in the context of an Arashem meta, we want to be playing Mystique as well. This means that we keep the Ravona package around because Mystique also goes very well with Iron Man. But since our big five drop is Darkhawk now instead of Sasquatch Mockingbird, we end up in a situation where what we're trying to do is a little bit more telegraphed, a little bit more five plus one-y, a little bit more reliant on Ravona. And at the same time, a little bit less weak to Mobius and contains a little bit more disruption. It's a very interesting dynamic that you can create with a deck like this. One card I want to draw special attention to is Juggernaut. If you can take priority, Juggernaut is a great way of preventing your Darkhawk from getting obliterated. For example, a Darkhawk into a final turn ju Mystique Juggernaut can set up situations where it's almost impossible for your opponent to like actually interact with that Darkhawk you get to move their Shang-Chi out of there. You get to move whatever it is they were going to play out of that lane. Or you can go for another lane with the Juggernaut and try to win a third lane with the Mystique. 
There's a lot of power and sort of flexibility in a deck like this that I think is worth pointing out. Of course, we all understand the power of the Fina Kitty Angela engine. That is maintained here, but I do think that this is a straightforward way of saying I am going to invest into beating Arashem, but also not just run Darkhawk as a one-off tech card the way you would run Mobius to beat Loki. You can run Darkhawk to beat Arashem. That's valid. This deck is saying I want it to be a part of my core game plan, and then just by accident, it is also very good into Arashem. So, full disclosure, I do prefer the other build of this strategy, but I do think there are two competing ethoses here that I do want to talk about, and both are actually very valid. Remember how we talked about how, oh, we're just putting a Darkhawk in deck as a anti RSM tech. That is the only thing that we're doing here. That's what it looks like when you do that in this archetype. When you just don't even bother to invest in it, you don't want to invest in it, you don't care. It's not there to be a card you play in non Darkhawk, in non RSM matchups. You don't care about it. It is there because RSM has a 75% play rate in top infinite. That's top 10% there. Outside of top 10%, it has a 73% play rate in top 50% infinite. And it has about a 60% play rate from 72 infinite. So, yeah. That's a lot of a lot of Arashem running around, and it absolutely justifies making what would otherwise be dumb deck building decisions. And I do really want to make this point because I think a lot of people are gonna be like, that's dumb. It'll die down. I shouldn't do that. You should. You play the meta you have, not the one you think you're gonna have in a week. In a week, maybe it won't be a good idea to just run a YOLO Darkhawk in every deck you play. Right now, when Arashem is at a 75% play rate, it is a phenomenal idea to run a YOLO Darkhawk in every deck you play. You should be doing that and abusing this as much as you possibly can, because when there is something with a 75% play rate with as defined a weakness as it has, you would kind of be throwing not to do that. Imagine if Loki had a 75% play rate and people were out here telling you, I don't want to play Mobius, the Loki play rate will die down. Well, no, you're in the meta you're in right now. Play the card that beats the meta you're in right now. Adjust in the future, but it's very important to recognize that both of these ethoses are valid. And this deck is literally just playing Darkhawk as a tech card, but if you have a tech card that works against 75% of the metagame, why are people getting mad at that? The other main method that I think is compelling into RSM is just playing the card Loki. And playing the card Loki is a very strong thing to do because RSM is such a deck full of big guys the way old Thanos was. Loki gets to try to free roll that as much as possible. I do think Loki is a little bit worse into RSM than it was into old Thanos, but RSM is less able to run tech like Mobius than old Thanos was because it's even less likely to actually see it by a time that it matters. So you end up effectively wielding the RSM decks tools against them. And because all the RSM decks are metagamed for RSM, they are all playing Darkhawk too. You get the Darkhawk, they lose. It's actually very, very straightforward. Loki's not gonna copy any of the cards that RSM shuffles in. So all you get is the pure gasoline that they are willing to sacrifice having those cards shuffled in for, and you're not sacrificing anything. You are simply playing the card Loki, getting all of that, and getting more of a discount than they do. Sure, RSM decks can play one card above the curve. They get one extra energy. You get one extra energy effectively per card you copy with Loki. It takes the strength of what the RSM deck does and turns it on its head. The one thing I'm not 100% sure about, I'm pretty sure about it, but I'm not 100% sure about, is the Blink bit. My view on Blink is sort of twofold. First, the argument for Blink is the only thing that really matters is playing Loki, so if you can have something that turns your other stuff into Loki, that's just a really good thing to do. The argument against Blink is it might be too late to do it on turn five. And I don't know if it's too late to do it on turn five, but it does sort of reduce the range of what your good outcomes can possibly be, right? Like you can do it on turn five and if you get Darkhawk Mystique or something like that, it's not too late to do it on turn five. You know, you, you just, that's pretty great, right? But you are a little more reliant. If you're doing it on turn five, you want to have the Quinjet down. You want to be cheating out a bunch of stuff because there is a lot of big, powerful stuff in the deck that you are trying to beat, and you wanna make sure 
that that final turn is going to enable you to play multiple of those big, powerful lane swinging cards. Darkhawk Mystique, Darkhawk Shang-Chi, Blob Shang-Chi. Stuff like that is powerful and possible when you have a Quinjet down and you blink into Loki, but not necessarily possible when you're just blinking into Loki. I find it to be useful. I think it is the right way to go. But if it turns out turn five Loki is just a little bit too unreliable, that would also make sense to me. It's just I don't think you're winning a lot of normal games against RSM with a deck like this if you don't have that big haymaker. And so I fully invested in, I want to play the card Loki. I want to make them scared. I want them to feel absolute, utter fear. I want to play Darkhawk Mystique on the final turn. I want to play Blob Shang-Chi on the final turn. I want to run them over, right? And so that is why we are investing in Blink. The main Blink interaction in this deck, for those who are unaware, is Blink will turn any of your three drops played on turn four into Loki. So make sure you're ordering with that in mind. Make sure, like, you know, you have a turn four Agent Coulson. You blink it into Loki. That's very good. That's like the staple bread and butter play of a Blink Loki deck. That's how you want to approach this stuff. It basically means so that when you didn't draw Loki, you effectively have five drop Loki in the form of Blink and, of course, a three drop. Next up is the KX4N slash Get Wrecked PF Loki list. And I think this one is yet another fusion of two things that are pretty good against RSM into one thing that is actively going to be good against RSM. Loki, of course, we've discussed why that's good into RSM. Phoenix Force is a little bit more in-depth. The basic thing is that RSM doesn't actually go insanely over the top when it's outside of the context of mirrors. So, obviously, when you're playing a 40-power Darkhawk or whatever, that's really good, but that only happens against other RSM decks. In a normal matchup, the RSM's Darkhawk is going to be like, you know, a 511 or something like that, a 59. It's not going to be that good. It's just going to be a card that exists. And the Blob is going to be, you know, 16 to 20. And the Mystique's Blob is going to be, you know, 16 to 20. And that's kind of like their best case scenario, right? What that deck really wants to do in normal deck matchups is go like, leech into blob into mystique blob mockingbird and that's a lot of points so what you're looking for in those scenarios is something that combos off early isn't vulnerable to leech and has all of these power plays accessible to it just based on what's already on the board that's how you end up at phoenix force right so you have this phoenix force combo where it's like all right you know cool if we get leeched, cool that's fine i'm just gonna move my phoenix forces around and get a bunch of dudes that's like at least at least four eight power dudes on the final turn of the game if i don't get leashed it's like five six seven eight power dudes on the final turn of the game it's a lot of them thanks to ghost spider dr strange things like that right and so you end up in this situation where phoenix force feels like the combo deck that is most well positioned into this because other combo decks are going to run into these issues of what if i get leached what if they have the thing for my thing they have a lot of tech they have a lot of shang chi's a lot of enchantresses a lot of rogues so you have to have a combo deck that like reliably dodges that stuff and reliably dodges Leech. And Phoenix Force sort of really fits into that niche very, very well. I don't think this is the only combo deck that you're going to be able to play. I don't, I don't even think it would be necessarily wrong to just like throw a Zola and a Darkhawk in here even. <laughs> like I think, I think you could totally do that actually. I'm like 95% sure you could just be like, I'm going to replace Arnim Zola. I'm going to put Arnim Zola in for... Uh, Eliath and like one, cut one other card for Darkhawk and then just be like yeah so like if I run into Arishem I just have two things that are 40 power that's cool too but I, I think that like you know maybe we don't need to fully hyper invest in that this is like a totally viable option into the dominant deck at the moment as well so I talked about leech stuff right I was like okay the one thing a combo deck has to fear is leech the other things a combo deck have to fear is uh the Shang-Chi rogue enchantress type stuff if you're willing to just say, they're not going to leech me on turn four, which I do think a lot of RSM decks are not playing leech right now, and I think that's a mistake, and because of that, this deck has a real way to attack those decks, you can play the normal Phoenix Force deck. Just play, you know, Shuri Nimrod and, like, make big dudes. Again, the power that the RSM deck puts out in non-RSM matchups one of the things I hear people talking about a lot is, oh, this is like Loki release, Loki collector, Loki collector. And I would like to draw a couple of comparisons there because on the one hand, yes, these decks are better in mirrors in terms of pure point output. But on the other hand, 
No, because beating Loki was kind of this esoteric path of like, okay, so we can't play any good cards in our deck. We have to figure out a deck that like sucks, but still has a game plan that's like just finicky enough that Loki can't copy it. And so suddenly you end up with a best Loki counter being a deck like Cerebro 3, which is just a ridiculous situation for any metagame to ever be in. With Arishem, the counters are much more clear, much more apparent. On day two of Loki, I don't think I had any good ideas how to beat Loki. On day two of Arishem, I have a million ideas on how to beat Arishem, and I think that speaks to like a relative difference, even if there is a superficial similarity, which is that the Darkhawk in Arishem mirrors is similar to the Collector in Loki mirrors in those early days, where it was getting to numbers in those mirrors that it wouldn't get to in other matchups. And that dynamic, however, in this case, is actually what we're trying to exploit. As opposed to in Loki mirrors, it was like, okay, well, your collector's not 20 power, it's just, you know, 12. And it's like, that's not very exploitable. It's hard to exploit a 212. You can't really do a lot about that. But you can do a lot about a deck that doesn't actually go super tall outside of those mirrors. Outside of those mirrors, it's just a ramp deck. And it's a powerful ramp deck, don't get me wrong. It's a ramp deck that has access to this very powerful multi-blob endgame. That's really strong. It's a really strong thing to do. But it's just a ramp deck. And that means that you can attack it by the same way you'd attack other ramp decks. By saying, look, I'm just going to go taller with some combo stuff. That's what I'm going to do. And okay, your ramp deck has tech in it. Cool, that's nice. But... I'm still gonna go taller than you and none of your tech hits this. And I think that is the ethos of Phoenix Force type stuff right now. I got put onto this Sarah combo type stuff by Emily. Uh, this is not her exact list. She was running a super giant type thing. I wanted to show a more generic version of this type of thing because one thing I'm starting to see a lot, again, it, it's kind of crazy how many of my videos are just like, here's an example of why some guy on Twitter that I saw is wrong, but that is what I'm doing here. <laughs> Uh, I see stuff like, okay, uh, you know, Darkhawk's not that good. They just always have tech for it. I always get blown out. They have the tech. They have so much tech in their deck. I get Rogue. I get Enchantress. I get Shang-Chi. They have priority because I invested in this. And so there are multiple ways of dealing with it. Uh, the Supergiant in the Sarah stuff, like, again, the Supergiant is allowing you to put the Mystique face down. Final card is Darkhawk. You get two Darkhawks. It's very, very good. Straightforward, right? The basic thing I'm trying to get at here when I talk about a deck like this is the the way Arishem has played to me in Mirrors is you have this incredibly powerful Darkhawk, right? Who is your monstrous dominant card. And then the mirror sort of spirals outward from there. But there's like three cards in your opponent's deck that get rid of that Darkhawk. So I don't even really snap it anymore in those mirrors unless I can figure out a way to protect it, right? And so this deck is saying, we're not playing mirrors. I'm just going to play all my stuff on the final turn. And I think, again, like if you put Super Giant in here for another way to do that, that would also be 100% perfectly acceptable. Because what I'm trying to get at is the core conceit here, which is if you throw priority and then play Darkhawk Mystique, you basically can't lose to any RSM deck. It's very, very difficult to lose. Because, I mean, I, I think that actually should be obvious at this point, because having 30 power dudes makes it very hard to lose games of Marvel Snap. And so the weaknesses that Darkhawk has into RSM are almost always the weaknesses of a, a, a raw-dogged Darkhawk. A Darkhawk that just gets thrown out there. Just like, hey, run this card out there, and then surely they won't blow it up, except they're actually more likely to blow it up than you are to have the Darkhawk because they have so much tech about it, right? Like, it's it's a real thing. They run three tech cards that beat Darkhawk. You run one Darkhawk. They're actually, even with 24 cards, a little bit more likely to have one of those than you are to have the Darkhawk. So you can't be too confident in it. You need to keep it protected. Sarah is one way of doing this. You play Sarah, and then you play Darkhawk Mystique on the final turn of the game, and then the game ends. Another way of doing this would be Supergiant. You play Supergiant, you play the Mystique first under the Supergiant, you play Darkhawk last outside of the Supergiant. Boom, you did it. You have two Darkhawks, they can't interact with any of them. Cool, we did it. That's the game where we won. And so that is the basic thing I wanted to get across here. I just destroyed the mic with my hand motion there. Sorry if that was loud. And the thing I'm trying to get across here is 
don't just raw dog the dark hawk keep it protected it actually is as good as you think but if you keep counting on one dark hawk with no protection winning your lane you are going to end up getting blown out a decent amount of the time and i think that's a lot of why people don't consider it as much of a counter as it actually can be because they're not taking these dynamics into account one other thing i wanted to highlight here was specifically black widow i am increasingly of the opinion that in a heavy RSM meta, Black Widow is actually superior to Rock Slide, just sort of straight up, because Black Widow is going to deny them an actual draw and not really impact how lane winning a Dark Hawk is, lane is, right? Like, the ethos for playing Rock Slide over Black Widow in a normal matchup is it makes your Dark Hawk bigger, and they're actually pretty likely to draw those rocks. However, in an RHM deck, they're even less likely to draw those rocks, and your Darkhawk getting an extra two points of power has no bearing on whether or not you win the game at all, because it's already like 40 points. You don't care if it's 41 or 39. It's fine. You're good. So, the Black Widow as a way of guaranteeing the draw denial, in addition to being a good Dark Hawk card at the three is, I think, an interesting adaptation. Like, this deck runs both of them, but I'm actually thinking about, if you go back to the uh, the Woody deck, right, I'm thinking about replacing the uh, Rock Slide with a Black Widow there, just because it's probably better into the RSM deck. And again, there's going to be a bunch of people who are going to be like, why would you do that? It's just going to even out eventually. But it's not going to even out eventually unless we make it even out eventually. There is a deck with a 75% play rate. You're kind of dumb if you're not building specifically to beat that deck. I have been informed, and this is genuinely secondhand, but it's like from multiple people in the top 50 have told me that they think that the mill clog stuff is good into RSM. I respect those people enough to put this on the list, right? I respect those people enough to point out that, hey, this could be a blind spot for me. Maybe it actually is good into RSM. Maybe I'm missing something. I don't enjoy playing Doc Ock against RSM. I don't like it. It's not fun. But one thing that this archetype does gain genuinely is that clog stuff is actually good into them. Like non-Doc Ock clog stuff. Debris I'm a big fan of. Goblins I'm a big fan of. Another card I'm a fan of in the matchup is Magic. Because RSM just doesn't really have a ton of room or reliability to get rid of something like a magic. Like, sure, they could run a Nocturne, but they're 1 in 24 to get that as opposed to 1 in 12, right? A Nocturne in a regular matchup is much scarier than a Nocturne out of an RSM deck. And again, you still have the advantage of a Nocturne being telegraphed. The real worry with magic is, like, they randomly generated a Scarlet Witch and robbed me for eight cubes. Like, that's, that's the real worry here, and it will happen. Like, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it won't. It will happen. They'll randomly generate a Scarlet Witch or whatever, and you'll just get robbed for eight cubes, and you'll be like, this deck is unplayable. Uh, not not citing personal experience here. No, not definitely not. Um, this is a relatively reasonable way to attack RSM. I am kind of feeling like, I again, I really don't like the Doc Ock, but I like the direction Clog stuff can go. And I do think it would be worth putting on here because that is a viable way of attacking RSM. They are trying to leverage this powerful method of getting ahead of curve plays. If you can just make it so they can't play cards, that's a really good thing to do. And so you have this ability to play around what the decks typically run. They're not playing Carnages or whatever. And I guess, again, they could randomly generate them, but you can't run in fear of that. So I do think that Clog likely ends up being something that is good into Arashem. I really do. Finally, and this one comes to me, I believe, by way of Gnome and Prodigy. And I don't know if this is their exact list, but I definitely heard the idea from them. And it's basically, what if we literally just played... Like, this actually started with someone saying, what if we just had a Darkhawk in our Living Tribunal deck, right? And then that sort of got to, like, okay, what if we had a Darkhawk in our Mr. Negative Living Tribunal deck? And this is not the exact list necessarily that I would recommend. There are a couple like little packages that I wanted to point out. First of all, just being a tribunal deck with negative in it is actually pretty good right now because again, you're going to want to have the surprise value of your final turn. Typically, these decks are, these Arsham decks are running Rogue, are running Enchantress. You can't be a normal tribunal deck. You have to be a tribunal deck that can explode on the final turn of the game. 
that is usually only accomplishable with Mr. Negative. Otherwise, you're just running out an Onslaught, running out an Iron Man, getting Enchantress, crying yourself to sleep, and losing eight cubes. So that dynamic is the first thing I wanted to point out here. The second thing I wanted to point out here is you can actually just jam a Darkhawk in normal Mr. Negative and then be like, haha, I have Arnim Zola Darkhawked you. We've done it. <laughs> like You can totally do that too, right? Like that is an extremely powerful play against these RSM decks. Again, this deck is sort of not necessarily a deck I would recommend playing, but a deck that is here to represent an arc uh, or a subtype of decks that can be built to beat Arashem. So probably this one likely ends up looking like it's doing too much, right? I, I can see that. But it's trying to represent the possibilities here, which are just like genuinely play Darkhawk in as many things as you can. Make sure that you have ways of duplicating that Darkhawk. Make sure that you have all of this stuff. Because like when you look at this, it's like, okay, we're tribunal deck. We're tribunal deck. We're tribunaling, tribunaling, tribunaling. But it's like, no, you're actually also just a deck that can play Sarah Darkhawk Mystique right? Like, you are a tribunal deck, sure, but you don't have to be. You can just do stuff and then play Sarah Darkhawk Mystique, and it's like, oh, okay, I win. Nice Arashem deck. Cool, right? Like, that is the thing that I'm trying to get at here. You can do this kind of stuff in a lot of different decks because, again, 75% play rate. So let's talk about Arashem the card and why people are calling for nerfs and all of that. Right now, RSM at a 75% play rate has about a 0.08 positive cube rate and a 51.9% win rate on untapped. Now, those don't look like very impressive numbers, but something with a 75% play rate is playing a nearly impossible amount of mirrors, and that means that they are getting dragged down as far as possible, because when an RSM plays against an RSM, that is by definition a 50% win rate. If you extrapolate that out, it looks like Arashem actually has about a 58% win rate against non-Arashem decks. That's quite powerful. However, I do think that a lot of that is just people haven't really adjusted yet. People need to understand, when there is a deck with a 75% win rate, or a 75% play rate in your metagame, you play to beat it every single time. There is 75% of the decks you're going to play are this. You need to hard tech against it. And a lot of that, I think people are like, oh, it's because RSM is so strong. And that 58% number, it does point to that. But I think it's very strong against an unprepared meta. And we need to see how strong it is against a prepared one. Because honestly, when I look at Darkhawk, when I look at Loki, I feel like those decks are favored into RSM. Just straight up, I think they are. And I think that right now, in a situation where if everyone is playing RSM, the best value move you can do is be one of the few people who are beating RSM. Again, it's hard to do. I'm not positive on any of this stuff. I'll be testing it on Twitch later. But I do think that this is what you should do if you're looking to climb. When 75% of people are playing one deck, the edge is in beating that deck. Thank you so much for watching, as always. I have been KM Best. You have been phenomenal. And I will see you in the next one.